Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Shield Wall Podcast. I'm Gilly with Sergeant Jones. Today we're going to talk to a 20 plus year Air Force veteran and talk about her experience in there. Jess, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Jess or Jessica. Um, I retired in 2021 after 20 years and nine months in the Air Force. Um, I have two kids that are teenagers now and yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> No, that's, that's great. And just starting off, because we, we're really excited to hear from another branch. We start off talking to a lot of, you know, Army. And so you're our first kind of other branch that we get to talk to. So what made you choose the, the Air Force uh, when you first signed up? Um, so I actually signed up, signed up in delayed entry and um, when I was still in high school. And I, I kind of knew that I wanted to go in the military, but like, as you know, Jonathan, my brother was army. Um, he had been in already, I think a year and a half or so when I enlisted and um, my dad was a Marine. Uh, my uncle was a 20 plus year army veteran as well. And so I kind of just wanted to do something different. Um, so that's why I was like, well, and my brother was like, you're not going in the army. I'm not going to have <laughs> my sister go in the army and be treated, you know, a certain way. Um, so I knew that was off the table. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so I was like Navy or Air Force, really. And the Navy, I was like, mm. and at the time, the Air Force, in my mind, it was, I, they had the most like women in service. And so that was one of the reasons. Um, and I just heard a lot of like things about, you know, Air Force treats their people better and things like that. And um, I started talking to my recruiter and I really liked my recruiter and he was really honest with me. So were those things pretty accurate with that you were hearing? Is the Air Force treated pretty good? Uh, barracks pretty clean? Yeah, actually. So um, my first deployment was two months after I got to my first duty station and I went to Kuwait for 47 days. It was right before 9-11. And funny story, we were in air conditioned tents with like partitions and TVs and stuff. And I was out there with some army guys and I was like, yeah, how you all enjoying that air conditioning? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Cutting our ass off in like these open bays on cots and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm really glad I joined the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> and your chow. Can we talk about your chow? Because when I went to Manus, we snuck into the Air Force chow hall and you guys had crips. Crips. <laughs> um, I would say like stateside, the Air Force chow was definitely better because I went to Fort Dix. Uh, from one of my pre-deployment trainings and I ate at the army chow and it was terrible, <laughs> but down range, uh, when I was at Bagram, uh, you know, the air force defects were always contracted out to whatever contractor. Um, uh, but I did sneak into the army defect once and they're like army people as the cooks and their food was a lot better. So I guess it just depends. No, I was just saying uh, my only experience with the Air Force was actually on my first deployment into country. We stopped in a place called Qatar. Yeah. And there was an Air Force deployment there, I guess you would call it, Air Force base or deployment. Uh, and they had a golf course, an archery range. They were allotted two beer a day, I think is what it was, something like that. And they had a... And Pool. Swimming pools. It was wild. I was like, what is going on? So I actually never got to go to Qatar, but I had a lot of friends um, in one of the units I worked for that would go there all the time. And they would come back telling me about their deployment. Yeah. And after I got back from Afghanistan, I was like, look, I don't want y'all calling that a deployment <laughs> anymore. That is like a glorified TDY. Where were you at in Afghanistan? Um, I was a little bit all over the place, actually. Um, I started out in Bagram. I was there for six okay. weeks. And then I got forward deployed to Shindan about a year after Shindan stood up. So it was real, still pretty bare base. Um, but I was, I had 
many hats while I was there. Um, but one of them, I was the like executive assistant to the base commander. And so I traveled with him a little bit. Um, so I ended up going to Herat, Mazari Sharif. Uh, I spent some time in Kandahar. Um, oh, okay. I've been in Kandahar. Yeah, mostly the Western fogs and stuff. But um, I did spend a week in Kandahar and then a week there again when I was redeploying. So, Okay. Jones and I were in uh, RC East on our deployment. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, Kandahar... Uh, Kandahar is where my other cousin was at too. Uh, Robert, Robert, yeah. Yep, second ID. He was he was there. See, I was yep. curious. Uh, in the army, every single MOS kind of focuses around the infantry. In the air force, is it the same, but with the pilots? So everybody kind of focuses on getting the jets and the pilots everything that they need, or is it kind of everybody's independent? Um. I want to say it's a little bit of both. So, and it also depends on the stateside mission and the um, overseas operational mission. Um, so, so it is individual. Like, I mean, my job was personnel, admin, whatever you want to call it. Um, but because of where I was located, I was responsible for all of the accountability for the entire base and not just Air Force personnel. I was responsible for all all personnel coming in, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, civilians, whatever. Oh, really? Uh, I had to account for everybody coming in. And, I mean, it was a really small fob. So, I mean, it was one person doing the work. But um, but because of, also, like, where I was, um, like I said before, I was the executive assistant to our commander, too. So I had to tailor to his needs. And then, in addition to that, I had a full security at the tower once – a week or so too so it yeah it was multi-hat but that was very it was a very rare thing for like my career field to have to do all of that in one spot usually like um someone in my career field at Kandahar would only be working like at the Persco team which is um the team that does all the accountability and casualty reporting and stuff like that um and processing out processing or they work on R5 ops where they catch all the planes coming in. Um, so I had a very like unique job where I was. What did they put you on when you were on tower guard 50 cal or 240 or did you just have your rifle? I had my M4 and there was a 50 cal in there and they're like, look, if something happens, you just pull this right here. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I was always posted with an army guy too, because they couldn't have females in the towers by themselves because of the Afghan air force. So they always yeah, had um, yeah, army guy up there with me for protection. So, yeah, I think that's pretty standard. Was the base commander Air Force as well, or were you? Was he a different branch? So when I first got there in May, it was an Army O six. He was infantry guy too, so he was a little different. Um, and then I think it was about a month after I got there, uh, we got an Air Force O six in, and he was I think I'm trying to remember like F fifteen uh, backseater navigator, um, but he was such a good guy in. Yeah, he was technically the army the guy was a good guy. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I was gonna say it's it's sad that I know what she means when she says different. <laughs> he was he was he was funny. Um, I mean, he did take care of us, but because that of that base being still pretty bare. Um, when I first got there, our perimeter security was run by the Afghans, so. You can only imagine, like, he would hop in his Humvee and do, like, perimeter security himself. Like, and as an Air Force person, I just, I was like, no six, like, doing this? What is going on, you know? <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, he just wanted to make sure that we were safe and that the Afghans weren't letting, you know, letting anything happen to us, so. So I saw that you got an Army Accommodation Medal. Did you get that while you were in Afghanistan? Um, so while I was in Afghanistan, because I wasn't in a joint billet, I got an Air Force Commendation Medal. Oh, yeah, that's what it was, um, Air Force. Yeah, and the only other non-Air Force Medal I got was a joint 
accommodation medal. And that was for my time um, working for some different people. <laughs> yeah. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> gotcha. Talk about uh, how many different deployments did you go on? Um, so I think it was four altogether. Um, I was in Kuwait in 2001, Afghanistan in 2010, and 2012 I went to Jordan working with um, the Army Special Forces. And in 2016, I went on a classified uh, deployment. What group were you with in Jordan? Um, so it was actually Operation Eager Lions. So we were with, um, if I remember correctly, it was the 3rd, 5th, and 7th. Uh, National Guard out of Mississippi? No, 3rd uh, Special Forces Groups. Oh, okay. So yeah, We were with 3rd Group. We were attached to 3rd Group. Three, um, I won't say their number, but we were we were with 3rd Group at, for a little bit at um, Syedabad. Yeah, so we were in Jordan. It was for, I guess they do that exercise every year. They work with like all the different um, international special forces. And it's a, I would say it's a joint exercise, but it's like, you know, they go out and play things for real. Like they go out and drop somebody off in the middle of Jordan, leave them there for 24 hours and then go pick them up. Like <laughs> just to practice like um, recovery operations and stuff. So it was really cool doing getting because i was on the j1 staff so it was really cool getting that experience to know um you know how the recovery ops work and stuff like that did you say j1 yeah I, could you explain i don't know what j1 is could you tell me about it oh okay so like as you know in the army like s1 is like your what support staff okay yep. whatever so um j1 is the joint version of that um, but I was working for a two-star general who actually, he was, um, on the ground in, um, uh, during Black Hawk Down in Somalia. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So I got to talk to him a little bit about that and it was, it's given me goosebumps, but yeah, I got <laughs> yeah. To, yeah, I got that's to talk to him a little bit about that and, uh, it was yeah, it was the military was... world is is sometimes small. Sometimes it's it's crazy. I remember when I was in um, Afghanistan, I ran into someone I went to two different people I went to basic training with. Um, when we actually got to Jones, when we actually got to Syedabad, um, let's see, there was someone that we were relieving. They were in uh, third ID. They were in my basic training. I saw them, said goodbye. And then another time, uh, I think it was a whatever i don't know what unit they were with but they were rotating in they came in and slept on our in our in our place and one of them was the, my bunk mate in basic training i I, ran, <laughs> I was like dude what are you doing here he's like yeah we've just been wearing IED, putting to sleep here and i was like what's going on <laughs> yeah um i mean that kind of stuff happened to me all the time i remember my first duty station uh, one of the guys that was in my brother flight in basic training ended up at my first duty station with me. And I mean, that just continued to happen, um, all throughout my career. I mean, um, I actually just went to Tampa about a month ago to go see one of the girls I was in Jordan with. Um, so yeah, that kind of stuff. And because of where I'm stationed now, it's the like central location for, all the Air Force like officer training, but also like the senior NCO academy and the chief leadership school and stuff. So I have friends that come through here all the time and I get to see, so it's kind of a cool place to be. How good in touch do you still stay with a lot of uh, your former colleagues and all those people? Uh, I mean, I, I still have uh, people I stay in touch with that I've known for 20 years, 20 plus years. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, a couple here and there, but, um, I would say I would stay more in touch with people I've been deployed with because I mean, you know how it is like when you're deployed, you y'all are like family and you get, um, super close, you know, you go through things that people, uh, that back state side don't understand or have never been through. And so, um, you know, those people are who you, who you go to when you're like 
hey, I'm having a bad day. I remember this happened and they know exactly what you're talking about and talk through it, you know, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a big thing that we, we always continue to see is just people staying in touch and and the support that you get from your, your fellow brothers and sisters that you serve with. It just seems to be have a major impact. And um, would you say during your time, what, what was the... Um, what what was harder about your deployment? Was it hard being a mother? What, what was that experience like? Yeah, um, I would say that that was probably the hardest part is being away from my kids because, I mean, not only do you miss a lot because like when I was in Afghanistan, um, my youngest was, he had just turned two while I was deployed. Um, and then when I came back, he didn't really recognize me. Like he recognized me, but it was like, I would say that Mickey Mouse syndrome a little bit. Like, I know you from being on a screen for six months, but in person's a little weird for me right now. Um, so my youngest son, because he was only two, he wouldn't even come to me for a little while after I got back. So it was definitely a difficult adjustment. Oh, um, yeah, that's rough. Mm hmm and, um, I mean, especially as a mom, you're like, I gave birth to you. What the hell? Like, <laughs> um, you know, and then the toll it takes on the kids too. Um, you know, my oldest son, when I got picked up for my last deployment, it really messed him up. Like he was like, I don't want you to go again. I don't want something to happen to you. And so, um, yeah, seeing that as a mom and how hard it is on your kids too, it was, uh, it was really difficult. And so when I moved here to Alabama, I told them, I was like, look, if y'all tag me to deploy again, I'm not going, I'll retire. So luckily I was in a position I didn't deploy from here, but. Well, that's good. I mean, that makes things easier. But I mean, I was deployed three times in six years. So I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. How was your transition out of the military? As far as the air force, were they pretty helpful with getting you out? Um, yeah, it was a little weird because, um, when I retired, it was still, it was the end of 2020. So we were still in the heart of COVID. Um, so mm -hmm. I had to do all my stuff online, but, um, because of where I worked, like I worked, I oversaw the office that did all that anyway. Um, I did all the transition services Well, I oversaw all the transition services and, um, so I kind of already knew what to expect a little bit. And I had friends that I had retired to. So I reached out to them, you know, to have any questions I had answered. Um, but I don't know. I think I, I was always in the mindset that like, while I have the uniform on, I'm in the military, but while I have the uniform off, like <laughs> I want to be at home. I don't want to have like be out near work. I don't want to go back to the base. Like I'm going to let my hair down. So for me, I think it was a really easy transition. And um, even my you know, close friends I had at the time, they were like, you're so much happier now. And you like are, have that whole civilian vibe. Like I already <laughs> went on like two weeks after I got processed. So. Well, that's good. That's nice that it was a nice, easy transition. Yeah. Did you use your GI Bill while you were in or after you got out? Um, so I used tuition assistance while I was still in, and I got a majority of my degree done. And then um, after I retired, I decided that's what I wanted to focus on. So I went back to school full time and used my GI Bill um, to finish up my bachelor's degree. And then I started using it towards, um, I'm working on my master's degree right now. So I'm using it towards my master's degree. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell us about the tuition uh, tuition assistance experience, because I know we've been hearing from several other people that it's highly recommended that, you know, people that are still in, still using it. What was your experience with it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'll say the same thing. I mean, I wish that I had finished my degree while I was still in. Um, but, you know, being a single mom and everything that goes with that and the military and stuff, it was just hard to get my education completed. Um, but the only negative thing I will say about tuition assistance is it caps out at, well, when I was still in, it caps out at $4,500 a year. So 
I think it equated to about six classes, if I'm not, if I'm correct, um, six classes a year. So if you go to a school where you can do like two classes every eight weeks, then you have to start coming out of pocket or use your top up with your GI bill or whatever, you know, so. So, you, yeah, you can't do a full time. You really can't be a full time student. So it's kind of slow, but it's still you could still do it. Yeah. If you're out at that that price. Yeah. And and you were going into criminal justice or swapping from criminal justice. So my undergrad, excuse me, my undergrad is in criminal justice, um, and then I'm doing a master's in social work. Oh yeah, social work. Yeah. And how's that looking? Um, it's looking good. I love it. Like I've already had um, two semesters um, for Baylor online and um my first semester i absolutely fell in love with the program and knew that that was exactly where i needed to be um and just i mean all my professors for my program were absolutely amazing and it's like a social workers or therapist you know so yeah. they're like, hey we need to have you know some self-care time or Hey, you look like you're a little down today. What's going on? You're like you're a professor, so it's kind of cool, like being in that program and like having a like on call therapist all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, go ahead. Go ahead, Jones. I was just wondering, are you going to focus on like veteran aspect of therapy, or does it not matter, or maybe um, so, a little bit of everything? Yeah. Um, so the plan is to have, do something that correlates with criminal justice and with social work. So last summer, I actually worked in a, detention, a juvenile detention center for a few months with young girls. And I kind of fell in love with that because it's like, um, you know, in high crime areas, usually like, you know, they, they call them career criminals. So usually they start when they're young, you know, so if you can be that person that intervenes at that age when they're, you know, committing their first crime or whatever, and then you can kind of talk them through that and be that person to, um, that they can confide in, um, you know, you can't help everybody. And I know that, um, but you know, save that one person from, being a lifetime, you know, committing a lifetime of crime, it's worth it. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, I want to help my veteran, uh, help the veterans as well, because I always want to give back to my service and, um, you know, I know what that feels like. So I guess at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is when I complete my graduate degree, I'll just, I'll, I'll go where I feel I'm called the most. Yeah, that makes sense. Jess, do you Let's think see. do you think yourself uh, being a veteran? Do you think that helps gives you like an extra credibility when you're reaching out to those young youths? Um, I think so, um, because you know I have when I was working in the detention center last summer, you know I had some of the girls. They're like, "Well, you've never been shot at, and you've never been this, and you've never been that." And you know, I go back to them and I say, "Look, everybody goes through everything different." Um, so I can't say I understand exactly what you're going through, but I have been where you've been. I've been shot at. I've been, you know, these things. I've been in hostile situation and I may not look like that person, but, you know, I'm a little bit of a girly girl. You may not think that when you look at me, but, um, but yeah, I think it does help to break through to those kids because they're like, oh, well, yeah. Okay. So you have been there. You know, you may not have grown up that way, but you've been in a place where your life is, you know, feeling threatened. So, so what do you think was your most dangerous deployment? Just talking about the, the that kind of thing. Definitely Afghanistan because of where we were. Um, at first, it was really quiet because I don't think they had figured out where we were yet or what we were doing there because all they saw were Afghan forces initially. Um, but after they saw American forces start to infill, you know, infill and everything, um, we started getting mortared, 
and all of that. And um, we had a mortar hit so close one time it rocked our building. And um, I went out with the army one time in the Black Hawk and we almost got shot down. We had an RPG fired at us and luckily they missed. Um, so yeah, that was definitely the most no. <laughs> dangerous. Um, now, being an Air Force in Afghanistan, is it was it easy for you to have uh, like a jet on station? So where I was, our runway was too short. The our runway could only land C-130s and uh, helicopters, and okay. and then while I was there, they had Red Horse come in and lengthen the runway so they could land bigger planes. Um, so I think. They ended up finishing it after I left that October, but now I know, like, I think within a couple of years, they ended up even shutting that base down before the withdrawal. So were you able to use the helicopters and stuff once you took mortar rounds, like have them go up and circle the area, anything like that? Or did you just kind of bunker down and, um, I mean, my dumbass went outside the building and was like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> but um because of my uh job too i had a radio all the time and it was not in the middle of the night but it was close like probably 11 or 12 o'clock at night um so i heard it come in over the radio first um because we had guys out on the flight line red horse working out on the flight line and that's where it hit um and then like i um, slept in the same building as my 06. So then I had to go down the hall and like wake him up and then, yeah, everything started spinning out. So, you know, I was just, I gotta tell you guys a silly story. You know, I'm a goofy guy, but, and Jess, don't judge me, but so we're on, <laughs> we're inside out of bed. Right. And you know, I was, I always had to do guard duty a lot. So I'm up in a guard tower and we had a, a female soldier fly in and uh, they were going to do some kind of engineer, civil engineering or something. So it was the first female I'd seen in like, I don't know, months. Right. And they put her on, they put her in the, whatever she was on radio for the, the NCO on duty or whatever. I can't remember all the lingo now. And I her, I radio checked her and I heard a girl's voice and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> And I, I kid you not, me and the other three towers would radio check her like three times an hour that entire shift. <laughs> so, Jess, talk about your time with the different aircraft. Like, what, what all aircraft did you get to fly in? What was your favorite experience? Oh, man, of course you would ask me that question. Um, honestly, well, okay, so let me start with all the different ones I got to fly in. Um Flew into Afghanistan on the C-17. And then at one point we went to, I forgot, we did go to Kabul um, with the Army 06. So we flew from Shindan to Bagram in a Seoul plane, which, you know what that is? Is that the, the it spins like this and it, and it turns, turns down? No. It's a civilian contracted plane. It's a short yeah. takeoff and landing. So they only have like eight seats on those planes or something like that. Um, so that was pretty scary. <laughs> so we flew that from Shindan and Bagram, and then we picked up a C-130 from Bagram to Kabul. And um, let's see, I, I think I flew a C-130 from Shindan to Kandahar. Uh, and then I was on the Black Hawk. And then I flew on presidential air, not actual presidential air like the contractor presidential air helicopters a couple of times too um i was like let me just clarify i didn't fly with the president of hey you weren't acting on air force one okay but honestly uh flying on black hawk was probably the best like i love that and being yeah with that's the, always fun yeah and being with the the two the 240 gunners like on both sides and they had me on headsets the whole time so i could hear everything so that was awesome. But yeah, I've never, so my favorite planes, though, are the AC or not AC one thirty? Um, is the Warthog? The Warthog. Did you ever get to do any airborne operations? Um, 
I know, but I did get to skydive with the Golden Knights when I was in, at Fort Bragg. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. But I, um, I had the opportunity to do some airborne operations at Fort Fort Bragg, but um, I was too busy with what I was doing, so I never went. Okay. Talk about the Golden Knights more. How was that? It was amazing. And those guys, like, I mean, you see them at air shows and stuff, and you're like, okay, they're just skydiving and stuff. No, they really know what they're doing. And um, they just made me feel safe the entire time. And skydiving was something that I always wanted to do. (laughs) But when we got up in the plane and at the altitude that we needed to jump and they were pushing me out the door, they literally had to push me out the door. (laughs) because because i was like oh shit this is actually happening (laughs) talk about that experience of skydiving i'm i don't think i'll ever want to go honestly god it was amazing you have to at least one time i don't know because so okay i went to six flags as a teenager and i did the tower of doom right and they just drop you i don't like that i never i was like this is not comfortable i will say I will say that sky skydiving is not like ro- riding a roller coaster where you where you feel your stomach drop. It is really like it's it's so hard to explain. It's like I mean you're floating, but it's like you jump out of the plane and you're just like you're flo- like it doesn't give you that like stomach drop feeling that a roller coaster does. And I will say, I think the military is a little different when you're skydiving too, because it uh, it does not feel good. It you're jumping from a low altitude, so the harnesses aren't nice. They jerk you real hard. You're flying in super fast, so you hit the ground hard. It's a uh, um, what is it called? The line static uh, line jumps. Static line. Yes, I would not want to do that. Yeah, they're brutal. <laughs> they're brutal. So, yeah. Jones, before he came to my unit, he was my he was actually my team leader and squad leader at one point in, in the army. But before he came to my unit, he was in uh, an airborne unit, the one out of Italy. So Oh, Italy. Yep, I was in uh, Vicenza for a while. Um, I saw you were in Germany, so you weren't too far. No, um, yeah, I was at Gallenkirchen, the NATO air base in Germany. Yep. And that's probably my, one of my favorite assignments. Like it's it's amazing over there. We used yeah. to go to Grafenvier and uh, Kaiser Slaughtern and one other base, uh, Honsfeld. I don't remember that one. To do yeah. a lot of training before deployment, uh, we'd go to Germany. I love living over there. Like I have always said, when I retire, retire, I am moving to like Crete or Europe because. It's my happy place. Like I love, I love it. I loved it. It's, it's probably the only other country I would live in would be Germany. It's a uh, boy. I had a blast there, and it's beautiful. The good food beer. is amazing. <laughs> good food, good <laughs> beer. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. Yeah, I'm always curious about this. I've, we had another buddy that's you know he was stationed in Germany, but can you talk a little bit more about your experience? What's it like? being because it's like a duty station but it's almost like a deployment but it's almost not like talk about what what was your experience in germany yeah so again um where i was stationed was a unique billet so i was at a nato air base um and we had no american anything so there was no base housing no uh commissary bx nothing um well um take that back and talk about that in a second. But, um, so we had to live completely on the economy and my first landlord, um, that I had when I was over there was obviously German and didn't speak a lick of English. So, um, it was very interesting trying to negotiate things with him and tell him, Hey, light broken, you know, like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um but i mean we did have a, a interpreter translator that worked on base too and that so like anytime we had to negotiate contracts or anything like that we would go to her or anytime there was something important i needed to tell my landlord then she would like write it out or go out there with us and and talk to him and stuff so it made it easier but um this is before google translate for anyone listening this yeah is- well, this is in 2000 
Because <laughs> it was in 2005. So yeah. when, when I moved over there in 2008 when I uh, left. So yeah, before Google Translate for sure. <laughs> um, but I will say that I am glad that I had that experience because um, just the way that I am, anytime I go to a different country, I always want to try and experience the culture the best that I can. Um, so learn the language, eat the food, like know the people and things like that. Um, so I think being at a NATO base rather than an American base um, was better for me because I got to, I got more immersed in the culture and got to know the culture better. Talk about more about, well, obviously it was a NATO base. You got to serve along with, I'm guessing with our allies. What mm -hmm. was your experience with the different, different countries that you got to work with? Um, so I'm trying to remember, I think we had, 26 different countries i could be wrong i might have to fact check myself on that um, we'll just say around 26. we'll just say multi uh national um so you know there are germans and french uh dutch polish but anyway um yeah it was different it was cool getting to work with the different nationalities i worked on the u.s side so um, my job was more so helping our Air Force people that were assigned there. Um, so I really didn't work with the other nationalities too much, but um, I had friends that worked on that side of the base. And I mean, the only thing they would say was uh, NATO always stood for not after 12 o'clock. So that oh. just meant that like, hey, once it hits 12 o'clock, we're done working for the day. <laughs> like noon. Yes. So the day was like eight to 12. <laughs> oh, that'd be yeah. nice. Not where I worked, but. Yeah, the, um, on the NATO side. Okay. They would go in in the morning and they would drink their coffee, their espresso, have their pastries or whatever. And, but I mean, um, a little bit of that's a joke because there are a lot of uh, different nationalities. They're very hard workers. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it was, it was fun because it was just, fun working with and getting to know different countries and you know their cultures and stuff too so did you get to I, see any like uh crazy bar fights between different uh different nationalities <laughs> um yes and no i will say that uh i did go out to the clubs quite a bit while i was stationed there and uh i did get to see a lot of fights in the clubs but it was you know, German and German, German American, other and national. One, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. But it was just funny. It was like, really, this is what y'all will do when you get alcohol in your system. <laughs> I actually got to do a, a large scale coalition training with the German army. So they wanted to do a battalion size tank exercise and wanted to see what it would be like to kind of maneuver their tanks on a another force. So we actually brought a lot of tanks from where we were at, went out there and did like a one month long rotation with the German army. Actually, we actually had the uh, Czech Republic army come in as well. And dude, it was, it was crazy. The German army actually annihilated us in it. It got, <laughs> so cold that I remember when they rolled up, I was like, dude, just shoot us. Like, come on. Like, get, I want to go home. <laughs> I was like, it was like negative 20 for the highs. They're all like motivated rolling around. I was sitting there like shivering with a cigarette. <laughs> it's, like, it's so cold in Germany in the wintertime. Yeah, it's, it's miserable. And uh, I just remember being like, they rolled up and we were like, look, dude, just kill us. You win. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the reason they had all those jokes about NATO is because, like, when coalition forces would come, there is more of, like, a break for them from their normal duty stations and stuff. Um, so I think that's more so what it was like. But, I mean, I worked with, like, the Italians uh, had a compound when I was in Afghanistan and stuff. And, you know, they <laughs> would try to go sneak over to their defect sometimes because they had Italian food. <laughs> And yeah, we that's good food. And we were eating MREs. <laughs> that's one thing I'll say about the DFAC in Italy is uh, it was a lot of Italian food, too. It was actually really good. 
but yeah, it's, it's so, well, and then when I was in Kuwait, we worked with the UK too. So, um, but I heard British food is awful. Can you speak more on that? I never really had. A no. Okay. Even British people don't like British food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who eats things with for breakfast? <laughs> I did get to speak to, a, I think, an Australian soldier. And since Australians have kind of similar culture than the British, they like tea as well. He told me why British tea is so good. And I didn't realize is they mix it with like milk and stuff. Yeah. And, I tried it. and, have, and have you ever had like a, um, they'll have like a Kung Fu tea. Is what they called it in Fort Collins where I'm, I'm from. And, you know, the British Empire spread along the world. So these different Asian locations have kind of like this British influence on their tea. And I drank it and it was like this rich tea milk. And I was like, you know, the Brits might be onto something. This is pretty good. I've done it to this day a couple of times. It's delicious. Pretty yeah, good. and then we bring the tea back to the U.S. and like load it down with sugar and water and taste like Doo doo. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to ruin everything, don't we? We do. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a bold take and say that we improved Italian food. <laughs> I love Americanized Italian food. I'm gonna play the fifth on that one because I don't want oh. <laughs> There'll I be a lot it. of angry people. <laughs> I love Italian food and I love cooking Italian food too, so <laughs> Yeah, see, Italian food, I liked it in Italy. Like, it's good. But, uh, boy, I love some Americanized Italian food. Oh, it's oh, got oh, the oh. seasonings I like. It's a lot oh, greasier. <laughs> <laughs> I want my spaghetti greasy and spicy. <laughs> mm. I like spicy food so much. I do, too. Me too. I do, too, but, you know, I'm old now and stuff so i can't handle it the way i used to <laughs> you're, not that, you're not that old come on I'm i the got baby. this stuff recently my pops came up to visit and uh he handed me this jar of hot sauce and he was like hey be careful you know i had to sign a waiver to get this and uh i was, was like, like well that's yeah i was like that's interesting but uh i i eat like ghost peppers and stuff like that all the time and so i it's salsa, so I used it like salsa. I poured some out to dip a chip in it. I took one bite, and my lips were blistered. I was snotting and sweating. It, it's brutal. It is brutal. My son's the same way. He loves, he's like, the hotter the better. Yeah, I, I like I like it, the, the, the good balance. I just want it to kick me a little bit, but I don't want it to kick me down. I like the sweet with the kick, like mango habanero like mm. oh yeah that salsa is so good oh my gosh go into whole foods and get your mango habanero salsa oh we don't have a whole foods here anymore i just go to the farmer's market that's something where we do all there. our shopping's whole foods they have something like a whole foods in every town like we don't have whole foods where i'm at but it's called pilgrims and pilgrims is pretty much whole foods and we just you can get that salsa there and it's just oh my gosh but yeah, hey, Jeff, transition a little bit back to the military life because we're kind of getting towards the end of this. Talk about um, what was your favorite assignment throughout your career? Oh, man, uh, there were so many, but um, I guess each one, you know, had its. So, I mean, I didn't have a normal career for my my career field in the Air Force and so, I mean, I went to, like, my second assignment was to NATO base. My third assignment was I worked in an intel squadron. Um, my fourth assignment was as a debt NCO at a um, ROTC unit in Memphis. And then I came back here. And then even my deployments, I mean, I never, they were never, like, I was doing personnel stuff or admin stuff. I was always doing something different. Um, so, I mean, everything my whole career, I loved what I did, but, um, I probably would say my favorite assignment was working in ROTC because I worked with, you know, cadets that were in college and going to be officers. So, you know, by that time I'd already been in 14 years. So I was able to, um, 
you know, mentor them and help shape them into the officers I didn't want them to be. You know what I mean? Um, and I would tell them too, I'm like, don't go out there and be that officer that's an asshole nobody wants to work for. And I would tell them straight up like that. And if I saw them, like if they were in a leadership position, you know, um, not being a good leader, I would pull them aside and chew their ass. Um, because I'm like, no, you don't treat your people like that. If like, especially like scolding people in public in front of other people when they've done something wrong. No, you pull them to the side and tell them what they did wrong. Cause you're not here to embarrass people. Like that's not being a good leader. So, um, you know, I still keep in touch with a lot of the cadets that were in there um, while I was assigned there today. And um, yeah, it was, it was just, a, it was fun getting to be there and mentor them and stuff like that. So. That's something the army needs to work on. Uh, their motto is kind of the more embarrassing, the better. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. I've seen I remember. <laughs> Uh, a prime example is I remember we were doing the, uh, and I'm part of the guilty party here, so it's, I can't even point the finger. We were doing the gas chambers and, uh, one of my guys was struggling to get his mask on and dropped it. So I kicked it across the room. <laughs> we, we started making this guy, we told him we'd find his mask for him, but he had to like finish singing the lyrics to a Katy Perry song. <laughs> it's just. Just for no good reason. Uh, that's... Well, I mean, I will, I'll backtrack a little bit and say if it ever came to a safety issue, then absolutely 100%. Because I went to uh, field training with my cadets one summer, which is like their version of basic training. And I had a guy start to march them out into the street with a car coming. And I, I yelled, stop. <laughs> And I was like, and I said, what the are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, so uh, there are times when you do need to do that. But it, like, I That's something I should have tried. I should have marched you guys into traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Air Force was ahead of us on that one. <laughs> well, maybe we're not the smartest branch after all. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite punishing stories, This it wasn't to me. It was to another guy in my unit. We were out in the field and he, I can't remember what he did wrong. I think he fell asleep, actually. I think he fell asleep. So they made him uh, jump up and wrap his arms around a tree and hug it and hold in place. And he had to yell, I love you tree. Like, for like, I don't know. They did it for like 20 minutes. That was the most degrading thing I think I ever saw in my life. We used to do that. We called it koalifying, where you'd make them hug a tree upside down so if they let go, they'd land on their head. <laughs> I will say, uh, you know, I think every deployment I was on, I worked with the Army in some capacity. And, I mean, y'all really know how to embarrass people. Yeah, they're good at it. Because um, <laughs> I think before I, I went on my Black Hawk a little outing in, when I was in Afghanistan, one of them, oh yeah, you all still call them crew chiefs, uh, was doing something. He missed something on the checklist, and I didn't think it was anything too serious. And the pilot uh, made him do push-ups, like right there, all his gear on. on oh, the yeah. Asphalt. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's never a bad time to punish people in the military. You don't have any shame for that, though, right? Getting smoked. Yes. Yeah. Getting smoked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They don't call it getting smoked in the Air Force? Uh, no. Y'all forget that we're like the kind, gentle branch, right? Oh, fair. We find more uh, <laughs> constructive ways to punish people. I will say, speaking of being constructive, one of the best punishments I ever did to one of my privates, instead of like, he was very strong. So smoking him usually didn't do anything. He could do push-ups for hours. Uh I forget what he had done, but I was furious. I made him, he had the weekend to get it done. He had to write a 5,000 word essay with every other letter being a different color, minimum of eight colors. And <laughs> it took him two days. And at the end of it, he told me, he was like, look, dude, 
you can smoke the life out of me. Just please don't ever make me do that again. <laughs> it's like, okay, fair. But yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, we're so in the Air Force, we're not allowed to call it punishment if we're enlisted. We discipline them because punishment is, you know, non judicial punishment and stuff. So, fair. See, there was always a loophole because um, getting smoked is improving your physical fitness and improving your PT score. That was the loophole. Yeah. So like, we're just, he, needs to, he needs to improve his physical fitness. That was, if anything ever happened. There it is. There's the loophole. I thought I had a picture of him doing it, but it was funny because when the guy was getting smoked, he had literally had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth while he was doing push-ups. Yeah, that's about right. That makes sense. But yeah, this is um, so me with the uh, if that goes away the crew when I hey look at oh, that if you'll, yeah if you'll shoot a text to Gillum with that we could throw it up yeah and, on the episode and then um this is from when I was Scott Evan eh. nice. <laughs> That's me in the yellow, just saying, like, you know, yeah. I'm not the one. <laughs> okay, well, Jess, let's just say, uh, put put on your Captain Hindsight right now. We've been saying this to a lot of people. If you could change one thing in your military career, what would you change? Oh, man. I think, you know, one of the reasons I decided to retire when I did is because of the toxic environment. Um and that's on a serious note. Uh, I think nowadays um, the military, well, I'll speak for the Air Force. I can't speak for the other branches, um, has become too political. And um, I understand, obviously, there's a mission to be completed. But at the end of the day, your people come first and you can't complete your mission without your people. So, um, you know, I... Obviously, I'm not a perfect person. I made mistakes while I was into, but I always tried my best to be the best leader I could and take care of my people first. And um, I didn't care if anything happened to me, like if I got in trouble because I was taking care of my people. And um, I think that's what's wrong with a lot of leaders in the military now is they care too much about what's going to happen to them if they stand up for their people. Um, and that's on a serious note. Um, hindsight, um, I mean, one of the reasons I did stay in as two as long as I, I did was because, you know, as a single mom, I had babies to take care of. Um, it wasn't always fun. I didn't, especially towards the end, really like it. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's, um, provided a good life for me. And, you know, the hundred percent disability and the retirement pension is not too bad. Oh yeah, for sure. Now I, I, you know, now I don't like necessarily have to work. I want to work, and that's a pretty good feeling to have. Um, going through some of the stuff I had to go through while I was in the military, I feel like sometimes wasn't worth it. But um, you know, it takes a toll on you mentally and and physically too. Um, so I don't know. That's what they say. It's not the age, it's the mileage, right? Yeah, I have the body of probably like a 60, 65 year old, so. <laughs> Quit. <laughs> all right, well, I think that's about all we got time for today. Um, okay. Jones, you got any closing remarks? No, man. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on. And I've been wanting to hear more about the Air Force. Uh, I don't know much about the other branches. And it's nice to hear the differences, similarities, and get to know you a little bit. And I, I would love to have you back on or anyone who's in the Air Force that wants to come on and talk about their experience and how it differed from yours or ours. And that's it, man. I hope y'all have a really good weekend. And thank you for tuning in if you were listening. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I had a good time. And uh, I'll come back anytime y'all want me to. Nice. Well, it's time to pop smoke. Everyone, like, subscribe, follow us. Let's get the heck out of here. <laughs>